Now that we've covered a lot of the preliminaries, we can dive into the fun part of data analysis. And we're going to start by looking at the structure of a data analysis, where we will define the different components that form an analysis and how they interact with each other. So here's the list of steps in a data analysis. You start by defining the question. This is a scientific or business question that you would like to answer with data. Then you define the ideal data set. This data set is the data set that you would collect if time and money were no object. Then you determine what data you can access. I have yet to run into the case where that data is the ideal data set. Then you obtain the data and you clean it up so that you can perform analysis. Then you perform an exploratory data analysis to understand the quirks of the particular data set that you've downloaded. And then you perform statistical prediction or modeling to answer the question that you're interested in. The next step is to interpret the results so that you can tell people in plain language what the statistical models or predictions mean. You should also challenge the results so that you can explain to people what the potential failings of the model are and so that they are able to make decisions on the basis of your analysis. Then you synthesize and write up all the results from your analysis. Here it's important to know that you don't include every single step that you might have performed. You use this synthesis to tell a story about using the data to answer the question. Finally, you create reproducible code so that you can share your analysis with other people. In this first part, we're going to cover the steps from defining the question to cleaning the data. The second part will cover all the remaining steps. So this quote is a perfect description of the key challenge in data analysis. It comes from Dan Meyer, who at the time was a high school mathematics teacher who was teaching word problems to his students. He said, ask yourselves, what problem have you solved ever that was worth solving where you knew all of the given information in advance, where you didn't have a surplus of information and have to filter it out, or you didn't have insufficient information and have to go get some. This is almost always true in data analysis. We almost always have either too much information, too many variables measured in too many different ways, or not enough information, not the right variables measured in the right ways. And the goal is to be able to filter or find all the information that you need and put the relationships together to be able to tell a story and answer the question that you're interested in. So the first step in a data analysis is defining a question. And there are four parts to defining the question. There's the scientific or business question that you might be interested in. There's the type of data that you've collected to be able to answer that question. There's the applied statistics or data analysis concepts that you've used to answer the question. And finally, there might be some more formal theoretical description of the analysis that you performed to try to understand the relationships between variables at a higher, more abstract level. Combining just applied statistics and theoretical or statistics or mathematics leads to statistical net methods development. That's not what we'll be covering in this class. Combining data plus applied statistics, but without any knowledge of a scientific question or a business application, is the danger zone. This is where you can lead, be led astray because you aren't grounded in a concrete concept or a particular analysis that you want to address. This class will focus on proper data analyses, where you start with a scientific question, even if that question is exploratory, collect some data to answer that question, and then apply statistics to be able to answer the question and tell the story with the data. Here's an example of a question. So you might start with a general question such as, can I automatically detect emails that are spam from those that are not? So this question could be answered in a lot of different ways, and there's a lot of different data that you could collect. You could collect the ISP of who is sending the emails to you. You could also collect information about what time the emails arrived. Or you might collect information about whether it has an attachment or not. Here we're going to make the question a little bit more concrete, and this is what you usually do in a data analysis. Here we're going to ask if we can use quantitative characteristics about the text of the emails themselves to classify them as spam or the opposite of spam, a message that we care about called ham. So now we need to define the ideal data set. The ideal data set may depend a little bit on your goal. If the goal is descriptive, you might want a whole population of, of objects. If the goal is exploratory, you might want a random sample or a whole population where many variables are measured, so you can explore the relationships between those variables. If the goal is the in inferential analysis or question, then you want the right population and you want to be able to sample from it randomly in a way that you can make inferences. 
If it's a predictive analysis, like the analysis we're going to be talking about in this example, you want a training set and a test data set from the same population. If it's a causal analysis, you might need data from a randomized study to be able to infer the causal question without further, more complicated statistical modeling. And if it's a mechanistic model, you might need data about all the components of the system and an a priori knowledge about how those components interact with each other. So here's the example today. We're trying to ask the question of whether data from emails can be used to classify them as spam or ham. And the ideal data set might be all of the data on all of the emails that Gmail has collected over the last 10 years. These data are stored in the G Google data centers and would be great for analyzing our question because there would be an enormous amount of data and they've already classified some as spam or ham. But now the next part of the data analysis is to determine what data you actually can access. Sometimes you can find this data for free on the web or you can find it amongst your collaborators or business associates. Sometimes you might need to buy the data. There are websites out there that collect and aggregate data on all sorts of questions that might be useful to you. Regardless of what data you're using, be sure to respect the terms of use and any privacy considerations associated with those data. If the data don't exist, the last resort is you might need to generate it yourself. This can be an expensive process, but sometimes if you have a very specific question in mind, it's the only way to get the data that you actually need. So back to our example. Unfortunately, most of the Google data on Gmail, well, I guess fortunately might be a better word, is behind very secure doors. So it's impossible for us to get at that data. Since that data is so secure, we might have to look for a different data set that we can use to answer our spam versus ham question. So here's a possible solution. Here's a data set of emails that was collected by a set of individuals and put online at the UCI Machine Learning Repository. Here we have about 4,600 messages, and we have 57 different measured variables on those messages that we can use to try to answer our question. So now that we've defined the data set that we can access, we need to try to obtain the raw data. In this particular case, the raw data aren't available, it's only these calculated attributes. You need to be sure to reference the source of where you got the data from, and obtaining the data can be usually performed by either downloading it from the data from the web or contacting the right people, and polite emails tend to go a long way. If you will load data from an, an internet source every time you perform an analysis, you need to record the URL and the time that the data were accessed so that if they get updated, people will know that that change occurred and be able to adapt their analyses uh, accordingly. So our data set, it turns out, has actually already been put into a particular R package and cleaned up so that it's easy to access. It's in the Kern Lab package. When you see a data set in R, the name of the data set might be spam, and then the package it comes in is labeled here in curly brackets. So because the data has already been loaded in a particular R package, if we have that R package, we're able to access the data directly. In general, the next step in the analysis is to clean the data. The raw data often needs to be processed, and it usually doesn't come in so nice a form. If it is pre-processed, make sure you understand how. So there might be several steps that were performed on the raw data to get the process data. Hopefully those steps are documented. If they aren't, you might have to perform analyses that convince, to convince yourself that the analysis you've performed isn't sensitive to different types of processing. You also need to understand the source of the data. Was it a census, a random sample, a convenience sample, or something else? It also may need reformatting, subsampling, or other particular operations that even once the data have been processed need to occur. You need to record these steps as well. A critical point, a critical, th here comes a critical juncture in a data analysis. You need to determine if the data are good enough. Sometimes the data that you've collected just aren't enough to answer the question that you want to answer. Rather than trying to answer the question with data that can't be used to answer that question, you need to either quit or change data sets and try to find a data set that can be used to answer the question. There's nothing worse than an analysis that's correctly performed on a data set that can't be used to answer the question because that's wasted effort because the question wouldn't be answered. So our clean data set can be uh, accessed by installing the Kern Lab package in R. If you don't know how to install packages, 
see the videos on installing packages in the computing for data analysis lectures. Then you can load that library by typing library and then in parentheses current lab and then typing data and, and in parentheses spam. If you look at the dimensions of spam you see that it's 4601 rows by 58 columns. In this particular case the first 57 columns are different variables that describe the text content of those messages and the last column labels it as spam or not spam. If you go to this website you're able to see the documentation of all the different variables and that way you can understand how the emails were processed. Since we are going to perform a prediction analysis we need to generate a test and training set. We'll talk a lot more about test and training sets when we come to the prediction component of the course but for now just keep in mind that we need two data sets that are representative of the population that we're trying to predict from so that we can build a tr predictor on one part of the, the data set and see if it works on the other part. Here we set the seed like we talked about when doing simulations so that we get the same random sample every time and then we create a training indicator. This variable is either 1 if you're in, going to be a part of the training set or 0 if you're part of the test set. We're generating binomial random variables of size 1, so it's one head flip, and it's a fair coin. We're generating 4,601 of them because there are 4,601 emails in the data set. If you make a table of these indicators, we see that we're going to assign 2,287 uh, emails to be in the training set and 2,314 to be in the test set. We can then subset the spam data set to a training set and a test set using a logical operator. Every time that we see that the training indicator is equal to 1, we assign those rows of the spam data set to be the training samples. Every time the training indicator is equal to 0, we assign those samples to be the test uh, emails. Then we can look at the dimension of just the training set, and we see that it's the number of rows or the number of emails is 22,087, just like the number of variables in the training set. In the next part, we'll consider the next steps in this data analysis.